I could uh, just do a opening prayer and then we'll try to do our hymn with our uh, new sound system. <laughs> anyway, we thank you, Lord, so much for for every day of life you give us, but especially for the Sabbath day when we can put aside all of life's concerns and all of our worries and all of our labors and just uh, focus on fellowshipping with you, Lord, and with one another. And we just uh, like to ask you, now that we're gathered once again together in your name, for you to come among us, send your Holy Spirit among us to be a uh, to lead us in our worship to you, accept our worship and let us be your people and do your work here in the world and just enjoy our time with you. In your name, Jesus, amen. Our scripture is Romans 5, verses 3 through 5. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Lord, once again, we thank you for being our God and choosing us to be your people. And we ask you to come among us now and lead us into your glory, to see you in your glory, and to adore you, hold you high. In our name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, when I uh, was working on this sermon last night, I realized, you know what? For our scripture reading, it should have started with verse 1. Because it just uh, flows a little better and it really... Uh, goes to the heart of this sermon. So I'll just read those now for you. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ for whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, Proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint, as the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So, you know, I, I kind of skipped, you know, for our reading, the two verses that, you know, the ones I like best about this, these, this passage. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in hope of the glory of God. I mean, that's awesome. We have hope. Hope in the sense of expectation, 
not just wishful thinking. We have hope that we will be in God's glory, exulting in his glory for the rest of eternity while we fellowship with him and with one another. It starts out awesome. And then, not just that, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. Oh, yeah. Tribulations. We get to exult in our tribulations in this world. It's like, oh boy, tribulations. Yay. But we can exult in those tribulations because of the expectation we have of the end result and the knowledge that we will be sharing in Christ's own suffering that he endured for us so that we can be reconciled to God. We can persevere. While I was reading or hearing this also, I, I, I did what I Sometimes do I get kind of got off on a kick of uh, looking up the definitions of words. So I started with perseverance, because that's what this sermon is about: perseverance under persecution. So let me. What did we do before we had these things? How did we get by? If I look this up, and I know what, I'm surprised at sometimes that when I look words up just in a secular dictionary, that there's you know a, a word that has a spiritual, theological meaning to us. I'm almost surprised sometimes that among the different connotations, that's what they call them, the different definitions of a word, there's usually one that actually sometimes is just exactly the same as its religious significance to us. And I think that I shouldn't be surprised because all of Christendom, basically Western civilization, all of our languages evolved as part of Christendom as, as the uh, kingdom of Christ expanded and grew and grew stronger among us. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll look something up. Like under perseverance, it says the steady persistence in adhering to a course of action, a belief, or a purpose, steadfastness. Okay. Then, Definition two, Calvinistic doctrine that those who have been chosen by God will continue in a state of grace to the end and will finally be saved. Of course, that's not just a Calvinistic doctrine, but it's also doctrine for Christianity in general. We have been chosen by God. And if we hadn't been, we could not have come to healing spiritually so that we could be in fellowship with him once again. Okay, I'll speak louder. So, then I went to, you know, the next word I wanted to look up. In this passage of scripture, that was tribulation. Great affliction, trial or distress, suffering. 
an experience that tests one endurance, patience, or faith. So we're going back to our scripture reading. We can exult in our tribulations, which is almost a synonym of a, well, it is a synonym of persecution in this case. That's one of the kinds of tribulations we suffer. We suffer others. We're just being, you know, getting by day to day in a fallen world. We find all kinds of tribulations. Just everything from making a living to enduring times of ill health. Pardon? That's right. Those are joyful though, because they come because of their source. But anyway, um, we can exult in our tribulations knowing that tribulations brings about perseverance, which is what we want. We want to endure. We want to endure in perseverance because that brings about proven character. And proven character, hope. That's one of my favorite words. Religiously. And the secular definitions are to wish, to wish for a particular event that one considers possible. But the second definition is the one I key on when I want to hope, when I want to share the hope that I have inside me that God has given me. That is to have confidence, trust, and even a third definition that is even more along the lines of the Christian definition of hope. It's uh, to desire and consider possible. It's a synonym of expect. A lot of you know that I, uh, when I became a Christian, I got in heavily involved in Christian apologetics. And went, you know, I sat at the feet of a lot of Christian apologists and theologians and such. And one of them was J.P. Moreland. And he shared the definition of hope that I go by. It's warranted expectation. We have reason to expect that something will come about. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts with the Holy Spirit who is given to us. So I looked up love. I had to look that one up. That's another one I think. You know, I mentioned that, you know, our language has evolved under Christendom as part of Christendom. But the world, the modern world, people, certain forces decided they wanted to move us away from our religious foundations. And so they started changing language. They started trying to separate the relationship between words and truth. So they came up with, you know, well, like, it's gotten to the point where you can put anything, any word can mean anything if, if you want it to. So, words like love. There's three definitions when I looked in my secular dictionary. A strong feeling, strong feeling of affection and concern towards another person. As that arises from kinship or close friendship, 
And I know, I agree that love does spawn a lot of feelings. And even, you know, certain feelings make us want to love. But love is not a feeling. And at least Christian working definition of love, the definition of love that I think of when I read it in the Bible that makes the most sense out of the scriptures for me. It's not a feeling in itself. I'll, I'll say what, what it is in a second, but a secular definition is like found a strong feeling of affection, a strong feeling of affection for number two and concern for another person accompanying by sexual attraction. It sounds kind of like lust. Or like uh, John Pyle, the first pastor I sat before when I started attending church as a Seventh-day Baptist. He was a marriage and family counselor. And he said his he said, you know, that this definition was love. It wasn't love. He said it was love. But he had big guys coming before him and you know, their families was falling apart. Their wife hated him. His wife hated him now. His children were crying because their marriage was falling apart. And it was all because he came across another young woman that he just fell in love with. That's it. Fell in lust with her. Even the third. Definition says it's a feeling of devotion or adoration toward God or a God. And yes, love does spawn certain feelings. But I don't think love is a feeling. My definition of love is to will good for someone. And good, that definition, as far as I'm concerned, biblically is what ought to be. A lot of people think just good is whatever you prefer, which, you know, that's one connotation, you know. If you, you, know, you buy your favorite flavor of ice cream and it's good, it's what you wanted it to be. But the most meaningful definition is what ought to be. So love is to will what ought to be for someone. So we will what God ought to have from us, which is worship. And he wills what ought to be for us, which is a fellowship with him, if we will go along. Okay, okay, it's all good. We've all defined our terms, but what is the point of all this? What is the point of us enduring? Because that's really what this sermon is about. It's not about definitions of other words. I just kind of got carried away with that But while I was writing this sermon. But why are we going through all this? Well, it's in the two verses I should have uh, included in our scripture reading, especially the second verse. Therefore, having been justified by Christ, by faith, our faith in Christ, we have peace with God, finally, again, through our Lord Jesus Christ to whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and, and we exult in the hope of glory, of the glory of God. So verse 2, that's why we want to persevere. That's why we want to endure on what may I did a sermon recently 
uh, called Why Did God Create Us? I, I could have used this passage of scripture for the scripture reading for that, especially verse 2. We exult in the hope of the glory of God, being in God's glory continually and forever. That's what God created us for. He was revealing his glory to himself, actually, but also by revealing it to us. Look at Genesis 1.26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, etc., so forth and so on. But then also look at verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He created us in his image. We are, for God, in a sense, sort of like what a mirror is for us. A mirror, we can reflect our image back to us. But we're a little different than that. That reflection in the mirror is not self-aware. It's not sentient. It doesn't have will of its own. And we have all that. But it's important to uh, keep in mind that we were only created in God's image. We weren't created like him in every way. We are not little gods, though we try to be sometimes until we get saved. We are not evolving into gods as as I was told by someone when I started seeking to find God again after living as a professing atheist for so many years. We are made in God's image, reflect his glory. We're not going to be God's. Look at Isaiah 6, 1 through 3. In the year of King Uzziah's death, this is a... This is a... Uh, yeah, it's Isaiah going into the temple, right? high priest and he in the year of king Uzziah's death I saw the Lord sitting on a throne lofty and exalted the train of his robe filling the temple seraphim angels stood above him each having six wings with two he covered his face and with two he covered his feet and with two he flew and one called out to another and said holy 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 is the Lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory. That's what we are here for too. Angels serve God. We serve God. We reflect back his glory. Because that's his will. We see his glory. We exult in his glory. And we fellowship together with the one being that will ever be that is both perfect and infinite in all of his attributes, perfectly and infinitely loving. And we stand in adoration of him Come what may, just as Christ endured whatever he had to, to
to redeem us. Now we carry that cross with him. We endure. We persevere through all the tribulations that we will suffer. I wore this shirt for a reason because this shirt is a uh, reference to the kind of suffering we have not experienced yet. In the Nineveh Valley, in Iraq, there used to be a thriving Christian community. It was, it was, they were, had been there for almost 2,000 years. They were probably the oldest Christian community there has ever been until things got stirred up over there and uh, certain powers started throwing their weight around and then the Islamic State rose up and decided they were going to wipe out Christians that live there and they almost have once what had been there for 2,000 years is almost completely gone, either killed, enslaved, or driven away. And uh, about while well, was, that was happening, some, I think it was a youth group, Christian youth group somewhere back east, I saw online these shirts were for sale. This is an Arabic letter. Letter Nun, N, as in Nasrani, the Arabic word for Nazarene, but Muslims derisively call uh, derisively call Christians. But the Christians don't take it as an insult. They are proud to bear the name of our Savior, the Nazarene. Remember during World War II, when the Nazis would take over a town or a city, they would paint the Star of David on the front door of every Jewish-owned business and home so that everyone would know what was going to be up for grabs soon after they shipped the Jews off to the extermination camps. Well, when Islamic State would take over a region in the Nineveh Valley, they would paint this symbol, this letter, on the front of every Christian owned business and home so that everyone would know what property would be up for grabs after they enslaved the women and children and killed the men. And the back of the shirt is the verse that I almost used for our scripture reading today. It's Mark 13, 13. You will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. He will be saved. If you reread Mark 13 sometime, the chapter is downright scary. It's a apocalyptic. I mean, you get verses like verse 7. When you, you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. Verse 8, for nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Verse 9 through, well, the last part of 9, I like. First part's kind of scary. Be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues. And you, but then you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. Okay, well, at least there's some 
consolation there. Verse 10, the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. But then you get back to uh, verse 12. Brother will betray brother to death, a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And then 13, you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Okay. But how do we find, where do we find the strength to endure whatever we have to? We get some, you know, encouragement here. Well, yeah, we find it. Well, I could just say here, but here. That's where we find the encouragement, the assurance that the Holy Spirit will be with us in our most desperate trials. We can be absolutely certain that this will all turn out for the good and for the rest of eternity because this is God's word and it says that will happen. But let me give you some assurance that this really is the word of God. And that we can rely on it by sharing with you a mnemonic that uh, Greg Kokel came up with. And we're almost done, I promise. Getting hot in here. We got started late. But I'll try to go through this quickly. And uh, in fact, I did not even write the rest of the sermon here. I was, it was really late and I was really tired. So I just let Greg Kokel write the rest of it for me. So I'll, I'll, I'll skim through this. I'll skip the intro parts and I'll get to the mnemonic. It basically, as he put it, six reasons we can know the Bible is God's book. That it was, you know, that its authorship was supernatural. And you go, start with your hand. The pinky. Pinky per, uh, prophecy. Deliteration, I guess. Pinky prophecy. The Bible is full of fulfilled prophecy. It's just full of it. Things that were pre predicted hundreds of years in advance. I mean, that that came to pass in, in, in amazing detail. I look in the book of Daniel and, and prophesying Christ's birth, death, and resurrection. Now, like I said, I'll try to wrap this up a little quickly. So. I won't go into all the detail, but that's the first one, the pinky, prophecy. You can know the Bible is God's word because of prophecy. The ring finger, the ring you put a wedding ring on, the wedding ring symbolizing unity between a man and a woman. And the Bible. It, it, that represents the unity of the purpose of the Bible, of the scriptures, of the narrative. The Bible was written by like dozens of people. I can't remember how many, 60 some. People from how many? 40? Okay, that's still a lot because they were 
It was written over the course of 1500 years. They were from different eras in different regions, different walks of life, everything from kings to shepherds to whatever. But it doesn't read like 40 or even 66 different narratives. It's all one cohesive narrative. It all fits together. It's unified. The middle finger, the biggest finger, that symbolizes the Bible answers the big questions of life, the things that matter to us the most, the most fundamental issues we have to deal with. Now, who are we? Why are we? Where did the world come from? Who is God? What does he want from us? It rings, well, goes back to the ring. It rings true. So we have Binky prophecy, the ring finger, unity, big finger, the big issues of life, the index finger. That's the finger you point with, the finger you might use while you're reading. It points to the his history in the Bible, the history that has been validated, that it that people question for so many years often. You know, at the one time they did, even biblical scholars thought the whole Assyrian Empire was a metaphor. But they discovered it, and they keep discovering things that actually happened. The Bible's history, if the Bible is supernaturally inspired, it would have its history right, and it has so far. It has its history right. So the in, index finger points to history. What are we left? Okay, I'm scrolling to the part. Thumbs up. In ancient Rome, yeah. I told you it would be in this sermon. In ancient Rome, in the Colosseum, the emperor would hold his thumb up if, you know, when a, a gladiator had been defeated and the gladiator that def had defeated him hold his sword up to the emperor and say, asking him, do I kill him or let him live? When the emperor put his thumb up, I mean, he's earned the right to live. He didn't want the emperor to do that. He wanted him to do that. Well, this is God's thumbs up to us. In the Bible, it tells us if we will be saved, we will commit ourselves to him, accept his mercy, we will be saved. That's the last one. And what does it leave us now? Fist. That is the sixth reason. A, a fist is, you know, powerful. If you put all your fingers together into a fist. That's strong. And that's what the Bible is. It gives us strength. It is strength. It is from God. From God. And it is powerful. Want to know how powerful? Look at one more scripture verse. Isaiah 19.35 In Did I get the wrong verse? Nineteen. Apparently, I did. 
There is no Isaiah 1935. All right, someone help me out here. Where is the verse about the angel wiping out a whole army in one night? Somewhere in Isaiah. Because basically when um, Nebuchadnezzar had invaded uh, Israel, and he went through town after town after town and destroyed fortified cities. And he conquered Jerusalem, and, or he conquered Israel, except for Jerusalem. Then he camped outside Jerusalem to besiege that city and conquer it. And King Hezekiah lifted his voice up to God and prayed and said, Lord, you know, he knew, Hezekiah knew that Israel had not obeyed God. They had made idols. And as Nebuchadnezzar conquered each city, he burned those idols, not because they were not of God, but because they weren't his idols, to his God. But Hezekiah said, we repudiate that. We acknowledge you as the only living God. And, and he begged God for mercy. And God came through. And by the way, did you know that recently I was reading an article that they think they have found those encampments outside each city, including Jerusalem, where Nebuchadnezzar encamped his army to besiege the city. They're, they're going through them and studying them archaeologically now. It'd be interesting to see, but here's what happened. After Hezekiah lifted his voice up to God, one night, God sent an angel. And in one night, that angel wiped out an army of 185,000. That easily. That's power. Angels are powerful. Or did you find it? Okay. Anyway, we'll look that up later. But my point is, angels are very powerful. I mean, that's just one instance of it. Where do they get that power? They are God's messengers. God has power. No one else. God gives. Every, everyone else who has power is got, getting it from God. Even God's enemies. God gives them power for a time. His power is eternal. God's power is eternal. So if Isaiah 37, like I said, we'll read that later, but I'm wrapping up the sermon now because if we have God's power behind us, no one can stand against us. And even if we are overwhelmed by the persecutions and the tribulations, we still can endure and bear witness to God's glory by, in that way. Well, let's take that power God has given us out into our mission field and witness to his glory. Everywhere, to everyone, so that they can see that our God is God. All right. I'll do a prayer, a closing prayer, and then we'll sing. Mighty Fortress is our God. Thank you, Lord, so much for being with us in this world while we suffer tribulations for your name's sake. Thank you for the encouragement we have and the assurance that we have that we can endure and that it will be all for the good in the end, and that we will be with you, exalting in your glory forever. 
let us look forward to that, Lord. Let us share that hope with everyone we come in contact with. In your name, Jesus. Amen.